Okie dokie. Let's just uh, seem to be live here. Yes. Should we, uh, should we go ahead, Sangana? Yes, I think we can. We've got uh, quite a few participants in the room, so we can go ahead and start. Fantastic. Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, this is a webinar on the MSc of Epidemiology here in the School of Public Health in London, Merry Old England. So I'm um, Professor Matthew Fisher and I co-direct the uh, MSc along with Marta Blanchiato and I would um, also a professor and um, so it's two of us and I would also like to introduce uh, Sangano. Sangano, would you like to say a little bit about yourself? Yes, thanks, Matt. My name is Sungano, and I am the course organizer on the MSc in Epidemiology and also senior teaching fellow on this program and the Master of Public Health. Great. Um, so I've been here in the uh, School of Public Health uh, in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology since 2002. So I'm as old as the hills. Um, and that's coincidentally the same length of time that we've been teaching this MSc. Obviously, it's changed very much over those two decades. But um, you know, this, is, this is a leading MSc um, course uh, in the country and indeed the world. Um, I should also say, that uh, the uh, Imperial School of Public Health is the leading school of public health, according to the most recent uh, REF research exercise uh, in the United Kingdom, and that also Imperial College is number one in student satisfaction for the United Kingdom Russell Group University, so the top tier of universities. So um, we're clearly doing something well, and that very much reflects my own personal experience of Imperial College and the amount of time that I've spent here. I really like the place and I think we do amazing research and teaching here. So I think I'd like to just impart some of that enthusiasm uh, to you all, um, you know, just to help you with your choices. So uh, let's, uh, let's go on to the next slide, please, Sangane. So obviously, you know, we've all shared, shared the experience of going through the recent, the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we all have a very kind of personal, uh, you know, into knowledge of the amount of conflicting scientific advice that exists at any one point in time when you have a disease outbreak or someone starts talking about obesity or mental health disease or you know any of the kind of acute and chronic ills that affect the human race so you know out of this kind of maelstrom storm of information how do we actually know what is good for us or even bad for us and to do that we have to apply the scientific method because in doing that we actually are able to say with some degree of certitude what is true and what is false. And that is what we as epidemiologists strive to do. Next slide, please. So here's a definition of epidemiology. It's the study of the distribution and determinants of health related states or events in specified populations and the application of this study to the control of health problems. So that basically tells us that as epidemiologists, we observe health, we collect data on populations, and then we apply this knowledge through the scientific method to actually exert some form of uh, control of the health problems, either through direct intervention or through some policy active um, uh, policy approach and certainly we specialized in policy specialize in policy integration of uh, epidemiology as I'll, uh, I'll i'll detail in a minute next slide please so why is epidemiology important well it goes back a very very long way and certainly london is a really wonderful place to study epidemiology because the subject started here with John Snow um, uh, back in the 19th, the early 19th century. So John Snow is known as the father of epidemiology and he was a, 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 a natural historian 
Um, but his, he had a kind of a spatial um, insight into patterns of disease. And of course, there was this very famous outbreak of cholera in Victorian London in the district of Soho. It's a fantastic district, wonderful to go out, um, lovely restaurants, thriving hub of activity. But back in Victorian eras, era, it was um, a very uh, uh, poor and um, had terrible problem with sanitation. So what John Snow's insight was, was when he actually looked at this particular cholera outbreak, that there was a contaminated water source at the center of it. This is, this, this is the Broadwick Street pump, which you can see here on the right hand side. And that by removing the handle from this pump, he prevented people from drinking the contaminated water. And this is what stopped the cholera outbreak. But it was this application of looking for a cluster of cases that um, he, was we, he was able to identify the source of this particular uh, disease state, cholera. Oh yes, um, I should mention, I've just seen Joe's uh, um, comment. If you have any comments uh, and questions, please write them in the chat so that she can um, uh, deal with any that have simple answers and then we can dus discuss others later. Okay, next slide, please. So this is of course a very ancient, um, uh, epide epidemiological study. Um, what we specialize in is modern epidemiology. Um, we describe the health status of populations. So these are all study, ongoing studies from the, um, from the School of Public Health. Next one, uh, we study the natural history and prognosis of disease. So this is a, um, a study on a, a global obesity. Um, we evaluate interventions, evaluate interventions. This is very important because a number of our students go on to get hired by various um, organizations that, are high, that actually go in and assess whether or not an intervention, a healthcare intervention has worked. So it's very important when you're um, funding um, uh, some form of healthcare intervention to actually be able to say, you know, did this have an impact or not? And by looking at the epidemiologi epidemiological consequences of that intervention, you can say, yes, we are getting bang for our buck. We are getting a dollar value or a health value in our intervention. And um, then finally, and this is where I, I, my specific laboratory comes in, we identify the causes of disease. And we've been very, you know, uh, as a, as, as a department and, and as a school, we've been in extremely uh, highly engaged in COVID-19 and understanding um, the spillover of the organism into humanity and its subsequent spread and impact upon society and how to control it. Next slide. So by coming and doing the course, you'll develop mastery and method, the methods that are used to find causes um, of health outcomes and diseases in populations. So you're gonna know, um, you can investigate what diseases kill us and make us unhealthy. How do we know this? Um, what interventions can we bring to bear on any one particular um, outbreak? I mean, you know, of course, this could be a chronic disease such as cancer or it could be um, an emerging infection such as COVID-19 or indeed monkey, monkeypox, um, which is currently exploding across the planet. And you know, we're very invested in tracking and tracing these outbreaks as they occur using the bleeding edge methods that are coming to us from uh, you know, the genomic technologies which are now available to us. Um, we, are very interested in inequality. Why don't all people in the world, um, or even the same city, have the same life expectancy? And just one floor below me here, we have the Environmental Research Group, which specialises in looking at the, um, the uh, pollution and its consequences. So important in modern cities. Um, you know, and, you know, thinking about pollution, what has caused improvement in life expectancy over the last century? Um, but why are we indeed losing the battle against 
uh, certain you know um, in problems that we thought we'd solved in terms of contaminated water um, and you know antibiotic resistance uh, in in the, the bugs that we combat in our in our hospitals things that we used to do don't work anymore why is this and what can we do um, and indeed you know what, um, how do we actually know that the stuff that uh, our doctor's giving us actually works you know are we being sold um, medicines that really are worth it and uh how can we how can we how can we say this how can we investigate that uh that situation next slide please so obviously covid19 has been incredibly important um for uh as we're a who collaborating center um but um we've so we do specialize in working on those spillovers and outbreaks of infection that have uh, spanned the 20th century. These involve the first COVID one, which I was um, involved in, um, uh, and other coronaviruses such as MERS, foot and mouth virus, influenza, and prion diseases. These are all uh, outbreaks that we have uh, worked on and worked with government to um, stifle. And um, in the COVID-19 uh, outbreak, um, our particular uh, uh, MRC Center for Global Infectious Disease Analysis produced 51 reports, 178 peer-reviewed manuscripts uh, involving more than 80 research partners in 80 countries, um, 12 policy planning tools um, used through the COVID-19 pandemic in 193 countries. So that is an extraordinary amount, of very rapid activity. And this shows what uh, the Imperial College School of Public Health is able to do. We respond very rapidly to emerging infections. And of course, as students coming and doing the course, you will be exposed to and indeed involved in this research activity. Next slide, please, Sangane. Um, yes, and you know, so we, you know, we spring into action when um, infection rears its ugly head as it as it continually does uh, as we proceed through the Anthropocene, and uh, we already have a monkeypox consortium uh, responding to this 2022 outbreak. Uh, again, another zoonotic spillover. You really got to ask yourself, you know, why are there so many spillovers of infection from wild animal populations. It's an incredibly interesting and incredibly complex One Health problem. This is what we're here to investigate. Next slide, please. So here's a kind of a constellation of um, words that represent the span of interest that you'll find across the spectrum of uh, principal investigators and PhD students, postdocs and postgrads within our school. We're very, very quantitative in our approach. We do, we, we want our students to have a good mathematical footing because they go and do uh, a lot of biostatistics. Um, we model epidemiological problems in silico, uh, but we also do a lot of, we, we, can, we can do wet lab science as well. I mean, I run a lab that sequences genomes like there's no tomorrow and you use this for outbreak in investigations and very basic population genetic studies. Um, but, you know, we also work in the community. We have clinical epidemiology. We're involved in, you know, um, nosocomio um, infection transmission within hospitals. I mean, you name it, it's done to some degree in the Imperial College School of Public Health. I'm forever um, breathtaking by, taken back by the range of research that our investigators do, and it's incredibly inspiring. And then if it's not happening in SPH, then it'll be happening somewhere in an Imperial College, because this is such an enormous university and there's so much going on in it. So, um, well, I'm inspired by the course. I mean, I love it. I think it's amazing. Um, I'm very keen on the university, otherwise I'd have moved and I haven't. I'm extremely happy here. We're building a new sc school of public health. I can see it out of my window and it's actually going to be ready for when this cohort you, you start. Um, you'll be taught in a range of campuses across, uh, across, uh, across college. So you get exposure to a real diversity 
of 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 principal investigators and teaching settings and you know this will be yours used in your research projects to some extent so Sangane, would you like to carry on please Yes, um, thank you very much for that overview of epidemiology and the work that's um, being undertaken by researchers at the Imperial School of Public Health. I'm now going to talk more about what you can expect of this MSc epidemiology, the course content, the applications process. I see some of you already asking questions about the applications process and funding, and we will cover some of that uh, in this talk. And I see that Joe has already responded to some of your queries on this. Quite a lot of the information is on our website. So she sent several links uh, to this MSc epidemiology website in the School of Public Health pages. I'll also talk a little bit about the research that's being undertaken here at Imperial in relation to your course. So that's talking about the different research groups and how you can start looking into their work and thinking about what you can do for your research project because that will be your, your largest assessment in this course. So this is a very intensive uh, one year full-time MSc. You will usually be ex expected to be on campus at least four days um, in the first term, uh, four and a half days, so one of the mornings and four full days. Uh, you will have an introduction to epidemiology research methods in term one through four compulsory modules. And in case you don't have a strong quantitative background, because you will need to apply some of these skills uh, in introduction to statistics and to infectious disease modeling, you will have uh, availed to you some optional mathematics and uh, linear algebra refresher sessions, as well as tutorials through the introduction to st statistics module. In term two, you will have an opportunity to select uh, five up to six elective modules, and that will give you an opportunity to advance your skills, to focus on your areas of interest, and to start considering what you can uh, apply in your research thesis, which will be in term three. And that, that whole term, which is four months, will be spent working on your own research project supervised by uh, Imperial School of Public Health academics. This is how the course is being delivered this year and should give you an idea of what you can expect next year, although I can't say with certainty what will happen. Uh, and you know we've had some changes in the last couple of years because of COVID, there was one time we needed to be purely online. And we uh, had plans prior to COVID to uh, have a blended approach to our delivery so that you would have some material to review um, alone, so asynchronously online and um, before class, and then things that you would do with others in, in class uh, with an idea of having more interactive sessions when you do come to class. And this is how we're delivering the course this year. We've tweaked our approach post uh, the lockdown and coming back to in-person teaching, which is now full-time this year, in that we have in-class teaching, which is mostly formed of small group tutorials, some lectures, very interactive sessions, as well as in, uh, asynchronous uh, pre-class material. So that is stuff that you review by yourself, as well as discussions that you can have with your peers online using uh, either Coursera or a Blackboard virtual learning environment. We then come into class and discuss what you have reviewed, and so have this blended approach and blended delivery. And that is across term one from October to December and through term two from January to March. You may see that this approach uh, and the volume of uh, the material that we review online and in-person varies across modules. And it is expected this term for two of the modules, uh, which is the intro to stats and introduction to infectious disease modeling, that you are on campus for a full day, the Monday and the Friday, and uh, you have more of the online material to review and then smaller in-class tutorials for the principles of EPI and the research methods module. I'll talk a little bit more about the modules in a second. For the summer supervision, we expect that you're in London for your uh, summer project, uh, but the arrangement for how you meet with your supervisor can be arranged and agreed with them. So you can have meetings online or in person, but the advice would be for you in the first instance to meet your, super your supervisors in person, and then you can uh, schedule meetings on Teams, uh, ideally for uh, ongoing support. And these meetings should uh, also ideally be every other week. And this will be in the, the dissertation or summer project handbook that we provide to you. 
other than the blended delivery of the core, the compulsory modules and electives in term two, you will have uh, the tutorials that I mentioned earlier. So the optional maths, as well as the intro to stats tutorials, as well as some research seminars that are offered in the department to both students and staff and career sessions and um, other optional uh, added value sessions, which can be online and some are in person. And in some instances, we're trying to deliver these uh, through a hybrid delivery so that you can either join in person if you prefer or view the seminar online. And this also applies to other college wide events uh, because we've changed our, our preferences, potentially have uh, modified or changed since we went into online learning and some people prefer to view most things online. So we're trying to accommodate most preferences here while still having a lot of the taught components uh, in person. So the MSc Epidemiology comprises 90 European credit transfer and accumulation uh, system credits. So these are the ECTSs that I'm going to be talking about here on related to each of the mo modules listed uh, for this program. In term one, as I mentioned earlier, you have all compulsory modules, and these are the four listed compulsory modules that you will take. We have Introduction to Statistical Thinking and Data Analysis, Principles and Methods of Epidemiology, Research Methods, and Introduction to Infectious Disease Modeling. You will also have some added value sessions, that's the seminars and tutorials, but the only credit bearing um, content that you'll be getting is from these four compulsory modules, and that makes up a total of 30 ECTS. In term two, you can select up to six modules. Um, and each of these modules, except for the Bayesian modeling for spatial and spatial temporal data, carries five credits, so five ECTS. As you can see on there, the Bayesian module is the largest. It spans 10 weeks and carries 10 ECTS. And all of the others, which are advanced regression, further methods in infectious disease modeling, emerging and neglected tropical diseases, outbreaks, genetics of infectious disease pathogens, molecular genetic epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, and nutritional epidemiology carry five ECTS each. We've uh, incorporated a few more epi modules here which are the environmental epi and the nutritional epi, which may not have reflected when you last reviewed the MSC epi website. Not sure if you've had any a look at the modules that we offer, but this offers quite a, a good variety of modules for you to select from. And you can select any of the listed modules as long as they add up to 30 ECTS. So if you select the Bayesian module, which carries 10, you can only select four other modules to add up to these 30 credits for term two. But if you do not take the Bayesian module, you can take six modules to add up to the 30 ECTS. This is how the modules fall across terms. So in term one, each module is uh, allocated a specific day of the week. On Mondays, the full day you're in intro to stats. On Tuesdays, that's all allocated to principles uh, and methods of EPI, which as I mentioned, has got some online materials as well as in-person tutorials and homework sessions. The intro to stats module also has uh, a, a tutor led session on Wednesday mornings, followed by drop ins for infectious disease modeling, which are optional and other seminars uh, and optional math sessions. Research methods is asynchronous, as said, uh, with the online and in-person material, and that's all on Thursdays. You should expect to spend two to three hours on campus on those days with one office hour every uh, afternoon with the course tutors. And all, Friday, all of Friday is for introduction to infectious disease modeling, which, as I mentioned earlier, has also got the drop-in session on the Wednesday. So as you can see from this, this is quite a packed uh, schedule. You will have a period after the first 10 weeks of term to uh, revise the material ahead of exam week. And then in term two, you will start on your elective modules. So first you have your exams soon after the Christmas break. She's not so great for uh, all the Christmas festivities, but also gives you a bit of time away from course because the college is closed for you to revise all of that material for any modules that have got exams. Uh, in term two, you, you have a similar arrangement in terms of uh, where the modules fall on the days of the week so that 
Monday is allocated to the Bayesian module only, and you'll have to look at the course schedule when you start the, the program to see where your electives fall, so that you can also tell if you're able to take uh, your preferred modules, uh, depending on if they fall on the same day or not. We don't have a lot of overlapping modules because we, we have been able to arrange them so that you can maximize your opportunities or your options for selection. But this year, for instance, you can only either take the advanced regression model, advanced regression module, sorry, or the genetics of infectious disease pathogens module. You can't take both. The same applies to molecular and genetic epi or nutritional epi. You cannot take both, but this year, and we'll try and maximize opportunities by rearranging mo uh, modules depending on uh, feedback from students this year. But you may, ex you should expect that this will more or less be the arrangement for you when you. Uh, when you join the course. The final term is a whole four months of you to, for you to undertake your own research project. So this is a 30 ECTS project and it is aimed at assessing all of the intended learning outcomes that are spelled out for this MSc epidemiology. So it doesn't seem like much when it's listed on here, but it actually will take up quite a lot of your time. So you should start thinking about the research project and uh, consider something that's of interest to you because this will take up a lot of your, your time. It's something that you're going to be uh, living and breathing for four months. So to give you some idea on what you can start working on for your research project, I'm gonna focus your attention to the research groups that we have at the Imperial School of Public Health. This is for you to consider the research that's already been conducted at Imperial and uh, for you to be aware that the research project that you're going to end up uh, completing will fall under the topics that are listed here. So I would recommend that you have a look at the research groups under the Imperial School of Public Health website, which are these six groups, uh, the environmental research group when you joined us just over a year ago, I believe. And they tend to offer quite a lot of projects and uh, are very engaged in project supervision. And um, the project process involves us requesting, uh, putting out a project call to Imperial faculty members or academics, and then they send projects that you can have a look at and see if they're of interest to you. And they can only, of course, uh, offer projects that they are working on or projects in areas that they're working on. So these are the topics that you will likely end up conducting a research project in. You can also start thinking of your own project under these same uh, subjects and propose your own research question, which we then would find or support you in finding a supervisor for in these research groups so that you can conduct a project that is of interest to you, that you have developed, and will support you in considering and thinking of how to coin the research question and to refine it so that it's focused and feasible and put it forward to uh, academics so that they can uh, support you in developing it further and then work on it in term three for your final project. So once again, do look at these different research groups, the people that work in it, and consider what work that they're doing is of interest to you. So we're still on the dissertation journey, which as I said, starts in term one. We'll be giving you a grounding in uh, the, the epidemiology research methods, as mentioned earlier, through all of the compulsory modules, and then uh, giving you additional skills in term two. But at the start, in term one, as mentioned, you start thinking about a research question and uh, carry this forward to begin the research project in, term, in April. Uh, and we'd expect that you would submit uh, a draft of your research plans by May. And this year, we are now assessing this component. So your initial work on the research project and your plans uh, are included in your summative assessment mark for the whole research project. It will support you in uh, kind of managing or uh, supervising your, your project by making sure you have the right number of supervisors to work with you on this. And then also having summer sessions for improving your research skills, your presentation skills, your analysis. So there'll be some optional sessions throughout the summer to help you with data analysis and be preparing the write-up and submitting your dissertation. And we expect that you submit this in August. Uh, it's normally the late August, followed by a viva, an oral viva in September, which is a presentation of your project. 
which some students have gone on to publish. So quite a few students have gone on to do that. Um, and we have a prize for the best dissertation. And the, the research project that you conduct can be used to sell yourself to uh, future employers who work in similar fields and can aid in career progression. So it shows that you've already conducted a full research project if you're interested in going on to uh, complete a PhD or work in a particular area of research. These are some examples of the research projects that are being completed by students, mostly from last year and the year before that. Um, the top four were offered by academics at Imperial and select, selected by students. And you may be able to tell from the topics that these are from mostly different research groups. We've got some one from epidemiology and biostatistics, environmental research group, primary care and population health, and our home department, which is the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. So you can have supervision from anyone across the different groups, but most students usually on this course take uh, projects that are supervised by individuals in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology and the Epidemiology and Biostatistics groups. Uh, increasingly more from the Environmental Research Group too. So I'd uh, start your search uh, of the research, so you, your review of the different research groups by reviewing the, the research that's conducted in those particular groups. That's DIED, ERG and EBS. We also had some research projects that were proposed by students. And the, this one on HIV testing rates in South Africa was proposed by a student last year, supervised by Professor, uh, by Dr. Jeff Eaton. And the next one was conducted by a student who is now doing their PhD and had supervision by academics at at Imperial in collaboration with academics at the London School of Hygiene. So those sort of collaborations are possible. And the only requirement is, is that one of your supervisors is from Imperial School of Public Health. So you can have a second supervisor from another institution. And their research project is continuing on this West Nile virus in collaboration with researchers at uh, SPH. This one is co-supervised by uh, Professor Ilaria Dorigati and somebody else at the School of Pub uh, at, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So overall, when you finish the program, we expect that you should be able to design and conduct uh, your own epidemiological research project and to interpret your findings and those of others. So apply critical thinking to the research that you review, as well as to the process of research that you are uh, partaking or taking part in. You should have quite strong data analysis skills and proficiency in using the software that we um, are now using for uh, on this course, which is R. And uh, overall have a solid understanding of uh, statistical and biomedical concepts to be applied as an epidemiologist. Most of our students go on to uh, a career in research and following the MSc epidemiology, as already mentioned of one of the students, they go on to um, undertake doctoral training. So that's PhD studies. And there are a lot of PhD opportunities and calls for PhD, his PhDs here at Imperial and through funding that uh, includes Imperial and other universities across the UK. A few do go on to work in industry, mainly in pharmaceutical roles as analysts, associates through in training pathways, or as epidemiologists or public health analysts with uh, Public Health England. It's no longer that called now that called that now. It's the UKHSA, isn't it? And local government, as well as uh, organisations such as uh, Cancer Research UK. Now for applications, applications, uh, the applications process for this program is highly competitive and we normally get 200 to 300 applications per year, but already looking at the application numbers this year, we may exceed that. We've had about 40, 50 applications this year for 25 to 30 places. So I would recommend that you apply as early as possible as the process is very competitive.
We aim to review applications within four to six weeks. And the applications process is a rolling one. So it's open all year potentially and usually closes around May, June. So we close when all our places are full. And it is possible that we would close a little earlier if all of the 25 to 30 places are filled before this uh, proposed closure of around May, June. So it might close in April or March. So it just depends on when uh, places are all taken. We expect a two one degree minimum in either maths, statistics, medicine, or biological sciences. Uh, but you can have a two one in another uh, specialty or in another subject, as long as you can demonstrate your suitability for this MSc and interest in it as well, of course. You should demonstrate quantitative skills because this is a quantitative heavy program. We expect you to engage in a lot of data analysis and infectious disease modeling. As you've seen, those are some of the compulsory components in term one and quite a lot, a lot of the projects do involve some quantitative analysis. So do you demonstrate this through your personal statement and through your CV in, in terms of work that you've already undertaken, the, the modules or subjects that are relevant to this course that are in your undergraduate and anything else that you think would demonstrate these skills through your personal statement. So you should have a persuasive personal statement, not only demonstrating your skills and your suitability for this program, but also demonstrating interest. So why do you want to do the MSc Epidemiology? How does it fit into what you have been doing so far? And how can it, we support you in a, your career goals or in your future plans? How do you think the MSc epidemiology fits in with all of that? And it's not important, it's not um, enough to just say that you uh, now know about epidemiology because of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and you think that's interesting and you wanna know a little bit more. You should actually be able to tell us about yourself and uh, your experiences and future plans that are concrete and actually fit in with what I've said about the modules uh, and the, the research that's conducted here at Imperial. So ideally talk about things that we already work on that we can support you in developing in this School of Public Health. You should also demonstrate if you're not from an English speaking country. So if you're not from the UK and other countries where English is the primary language, the higher requirements for English language qualifications, which is the overall um, IELTS, that's one of the examples of seven or above and 6.5 in each element, although other test scores are uh, accepted. So do check the Imperial website of details of the different English tests that you can take. And then you should have strong references, uh, at least one academic reference. With regards to funding, there is at least one scholarship that is offered for the MSc Epidemiology, which covers home tuition fees. Now, this has not been opened yet for application. And up last year, it was up to 14,000, or sorry, up to 13,000 pounds, which was uh, the total of the home fees for the MSc Epidemiology. So please do check the, follow the links that I have included below and check what the amounts that are covered are this year for home tuition fees for the MSc Epidemiology. It's open to everyone, to home, EU and overseas applications, but will only cover home tuition fees. And uh, I'd expect that this will close either end of April or beginning of May next year. There are also up to 10 Dean's Master Scholarships that cover up to 10,000 pounds. So each one of those scholarships is worth 10,000 pounds. And uh, these are for all uh, postgraduate programs across the faculty of, so all postgraduate programs, I believe, across the faculty of medicine. And we would normally have one being uh, given to an MSc epidemiology student. For further information, do you check the Imperial website as said, I've added those links there. So follow those for the two different scholarships. Beyond Imperial, there are several scholarships that will cover for international students full fees, such as the Chevening and the Commonwealth scholarships. And you might have some scholarship opportunities within your country, but most of the scholarship students that we get on here, and we do get several, um, I believe this year we have quite a few of both the Commonwealth and Chevening scholarships. So I would encourage you to apply for those. And for UK students, you've also got the UK master's loans. Then this is only open to UK nationals. 
So that is all on the application process, the course content and funding. But I'd encourage you to also get a better idea of what epidemiology really is about. And there is quite a lot that you, you may already be quite familiar with uh, what the realms or what uh, epidemiology research involves and how it affects your life and what it means in, in general. But actually, uh, you might find that it, um, it covers more areas of your life than you would think. And it is actually really interesting. I think I'm quite enthused about uh, what I do. And there is more information that you can read on through such readings there that I've listed above, such as Fair Society, Healthy Lives. That was a report by Professor Michael Marmot. And we had a recent talk by uh, Professor David Spiegelholzer, who talks about the art of statistics and especially talks about it in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic recently and how to communicate those statistics and how we've had those controversies about what exactly the researchers mean and the challenges of communicating that research as a statistician or epidemiologist. He also has um, a podcast called Risky Talk. So this package is it in a way that's very easy to understand for men on the street and it'll be a good start for you to start understanding uh, more of this research and what you'll be doing. There is another podcast that I like that's called Casual Inference and that calls, talks about causal inference in epidemiology. So using observational data to infer causation. And uh, this is in a very casual conversational manner which is why it's called Casual Inference. And I would also recommend this book by uh, Professor Ben Goldacre, who also gave a talk recently here at Imperial called Bad Science, talks about the evidence that we use to inform our lives, or at least the evidence that is used uh, to inform how what medicines we are prescribed, so uh, how data is used to decide what drugs are recommended for various illnesses and other things related to uh, scientific research that informs daily how we, we live. So if you are interested in hearing more and just getting a better understanding of this, I would recommend those sources. Otherwise, I would also advise that you contact us if you have any questions about the MSc epidemiology. You can email us, we all, have, we all get the email if you email MSE Epidemiology at imperial.ac.uk or visit the website for further details or anything that I have not covered. So hopefully I have not uh, spent too long talking about the course and have left a little bit of time for you to ask questions. And I wonder if you have anything that, I, that you think I've left out, Matt, that you would like to add before we take any questions that I have not yet been addressed in the q a there yeah, I, th I think we've done we've done a good justice to the the course um should we, should we have a look at the questions in the chat i mean charlotte uh hodgson hi charlotte says uh, wants to know whether there'd be any space to specialize in nutritional epidemiology so that's our um our newest module isn't it so the the answer to that is a resounding yes absolutely there would would um would be very would be able to offer extremely exciting dissertation projects on uh on on that um, on that topic. Yes, that's correct. So there is the nutritional epi module as well as supervision, potential supervision for projects, both within the uh, epidemiology and biostats department. So look at the research that's conducted there using secondary data by Professor Elio Boli and uh, other teams actually in EBS, as well as uh, some studies and data collected by groups in primary care and population health. So look at the different subjects that they're covering and you might find something of interest there, but you have an opportunity to develop your interests in nutritional epi and also conduct a project. Uh, yeah. on that topic. Um, and then we've got a question on uh, what statistical program do we use? Well, um, that's R uh, is throughout the course. Um, so definitely by the by by the end of the uh, the masters, you will be adept in the use of R and indeed arriving um, at the beginning of the course with some knowledge on R is certainly to be uh, to be recommended. Yes, and I would uh, advise that if, if you have not used R before, 
please uh, review some of the freely available online courses and uh, material that will just get you started give you a brief introduction to that so that you don't spend so much time trying to learn and navigate R once you get here. And if you are offered a place, we'll send you some resources and information on where you can get started in downloading R and uh, working out the basics, just exploring how to use it so that, yeah. as I'm saying, you don't get bogged down once you're here. So don't wait until you come to Imperial to download R. Mm -hmm. At the very least, have a look at the interface and start playing with it. And this is a very fast paced course, so you certainly want to arrive um, with, you know, your, your, your footing firmly established. Um, although, of course, we do um, do train you as well. So Caroline Tangoran wants to know what uh, data sources do students typically work with their dissertation? Uh, do students ever collect primary data or are they typically working with publicly publicly available data um, or use? Professor's primary data. So, I mean, obviously, there's no 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 one rule here. So, students in uh, doing a project with me will be collecting primary data. They'll be isolating pathogens. They'll be sequencing their genomes, and they'll be integrating those genomes into pre-existing uh, population genomic data sets. And so, yes, definitely primary data to collection. Um, a lot of students use big cohort databases. So there's, you know, there's huge um, uh, uh, cancer cancer databases and so on and so forth. Um, they you'll be you'll be integrated doing novel statistical approaches to you know answer your particular um, hypothesis. Um, and yeah, so but but generally, the projects that you do, we. Uh, you're generally helping to get those published, if not leading the publication yourself. So you will be working on original data a lot of the time. Um, and I would add that there, there are a lot of data sources that are housed here at Imperial, or, mm. uh, or at least collaborations um, in managing data sets like uh, the EPIC study, Biobank, we've, we've had researchers using the Millennium Cohort study in PCPH, um, and quite a lot of the projects that MSc students do undertake use secondary data. Uh, but as, as Max mentioned, the primary data, particularly for the, the type of projects that he offers, is an option, as well as potentially primary data through uh, interviews. But that would mainly likely be a mixed methods research where you demonstrate the quantitative component that's required uh, for, for your program ILOs, and then supplement that with um, interviews, depending on the sort of research question that's asked. So there is potential for, for collecting your own data. The only limit to this might be the timeline and the requirements for ethics approval if you're interviewing humans. So if you're including people in your study, you have to have ethics approval, which can take a bit of time. And usually the ethics processes, if you're conducting analysis using secondary data, will be uh, a lot simpler. Great. So in terms of um, the next two questions are both about what constitutes a good mathematical footing um, and how much statistical experience we require for the course. I mean, there's no particularly uh, simple answer to that question. We, we do expect a good solid quantitative background and a demonstrated ability to work uh, with, with quantitative data. Um, so having uh, specific uh, statistical modules in your bachelor's is uh, is very useful. It's not totally essential. We have made exceptions in the past because students have persuaded us that they're smart enough and fast enough to pick this up on the job. And those and 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 that's generally worked out really well. But um, yeah, having having done a a a, a course that has you know approaches health quantitative approaches to health is very useful would you like to say more Sangano? um not much more than what you said so just a demonstration of exposure to that within your undergrad and it'd be useful to just see what sort of stats or math modules you've taken and how well you did in them and if you can demonstrate other things that you've done through research projects or some activities that are not necessarily listed in your transcript that would be a good demonstration of the math skills that you have uh 
so it's a combination of what you're demonstrating through your um, undergrad, which is, as I said, is usually uh, one in maths or another quant containing uh, undergrad. But if it's, it's not that, then you should try and demonstrate your ability to keep up or dem demonstrate your uh, experience from elsewhere. So the next question is one of my one of my references coming outside of public health needs some guidance on what to put in the uh, uh, the, the reference um, and what skills are most important. I, I quite like this list: quantitative reasoning, critical thinking, leadership, work ethic, research creativity, interpersonal skills. I mean, those are they're all really important um, attributes, and I think the fact that you're actually kind of detailing them shows that you have a very good insight into what's actually important in the course. I mean, certainly critical thinking, astonishingly important. Um, you know, scientists, you know, this is our, our main um, application of Occam's razor. Is, you know, we think critically about problems. We don't just accept. Um, quantitative reasoning, again, just so intrinsic to the study of epidemiology. Um, leadership. Well, we do a lot of group work and, and um, you know, if being able to kind of develop your leadership skills is something we teach, but it's something that um, is important to arrive with um, and a work ethic. I mean, like we've said, this is a fast paced course. You, you know, you, you, you will have to have a good work ethic. It's not a it's not an easy breeze. Um, research creativity. Yeah, I mean. We, again, we tra we're training you in this, but if you if you have uh, creatively used, done any research, um, addressed any research topic, then that's useful to know about. And interpersonal skills, well, like I've said, you will be working with other students. We're very keen on peer learning, um, group group activities, and you speaking your mind because learning how to communicate science is really really important again, as we've seen with COVID-19 and what Sangano said about um, the communication of statistical um, considerations around, around health data. Um, so yes, really, really nice thoughts there. But yes, <laughs> they're all important, but certainly critical thinking is, is up there in quantitative approaches. I would also suggest that you provide them with the program specification so that they can also honestly consider if you're suitable for this course. So they know you and they know your background and then they can see from the specification what they should highlight and which are mostly those uh, components that you've already listed, but they'd be able to target it more accurately to what we're saying we're offering on this course. And it's so much better if the uh, referee speaks directly to us about your suitability to the course based on what you supplied as the content of the course and based on their knowledge of you. Those are the, the references that are um, quite telling of the suitability. And yeah, do provide them with the, the program specification so they can review it and see what to highlight. And I also really love this final question. There's um, a quick comment to say thank you for a great session. And it's the fact that it's an enthusiastic and genuinely informative um, uh, session. I mean, I think this does reflect actually just the fact that we really are excited about epidemiology. And I don't know if you can see these pictures behind me. I've got a bunch of frogs on the wall. But, you know, I've spent most of my career working on wildlife epidemiology um, of this, uh, an amphibian panzootic. And, you know, you'd think that that's incredibly left field, but actually it's just symptomatic of one health and there's been recent papers showing that as frogs go extinct then mosquitoes climb up in um, their density which forces malaria rates in in Central America so you know everything is interlinked and this is what's wonderful about epidemiology is it knits together all these diverse drivers that influence human health and we've just got a bit of everything going on um, here in the, in the Imperial School of Public Health, from you know frog biology through to you know epic cohorts through to you know all of this, and you know really it's just the student you students coming into the course is what fuel is is the fuel which enables us with very busy lives to just drive forward the research agendas which are so very important today. Um, so you know thank you for recognizing that.
Yeah, I, I would add that we're actually normally even more enthusiastic about the course and about what we do. And uh, that this is something that's come across in uh, early feedback from the current cohort. We're, we're now in week seven of their course. Mm. They're, they're really enjoying the, enthusiasm, the enthusiasm of all the course tutors on the compulsory modules that they're taking and our dedication to making sure that you have the best student experience possible, which came across even from induction week and through to now, like we're really proud of the work that we're doing with students. So I say this with pride. I think this is a fantastic institution and this course is, is really, really good. If there were more places, it would be a fantastic opportunity for you to just experience a great MSc epidemiology program at a fantastic institution. But thank you for that comment earlier. Hmm. Great. Well, I think we're at the top of the hour. So, um, and no, no more questions. So th thank you very much for making the time. Um, to, to visit us here and um, yeah, hope to see some of you in the future. Yes, we look forward to that. And thank you very much, Matt, and okay. everybody for attending. Yes. All right.